Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Donahoe. Welcome to the Wealth Standard Podcast. This episode is an interesting one. It's an interview with the son of Milton Friedman, who is one of the most famous American economists. Uh, he won uh, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize back in the 1970s. And his son is also a intellectual. He has written a few books. He is also uh, an emeritus professor uh, in in law and a few other subjects. And you know, this was a, a profoundly intellectual conversation, and it was about uh, some of the philosophy of economics and politics. And really, it really got deep. And I would say it was uh, it was it was intimidating uh, for for me. Uh, because of how it made me think and uh, process some of the information that David was saying. Now, of course, this season of the Wealth Standard podcast is on the entrepreneur. And so my intention with David was to get into really the environment in which the entrepreneurial mind operates. Uh, And we definitely got there, but it was in a way that I did not anticipate. So I hope you guys enjoy if you like what you're hearing and learning on the podcast, you're, you're, you're probably asking yourself, how, how can I apply this? Well, that's why I wrote the book that I released in 2018 called Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, a financial strategy to reignite the American dream. Now, that saying is, is interesting. It's actually a pretty old saying, and it alludes to a system set up for uh, a certain party to win. Now, in most cases, it applies to the political and economic system that we all operate in, which I argue in the book is not set up for us to win, but set up for them to win. And the book teaches you how to turn that table. Now, for a limited time, you can actually get the book for just the cost of of shipping. And I'm actually throwing in the audio book as well uh, for for no cost. So go ahead and head over to freebook.headsortailsiwin.com now. All right, David. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I can't wait for this interview. I've been looking forward to it for uh, for a little over a month now. So I, I think the best way to start the conversation is is the way in which you kind of describe uh, your view of the world by title, which is uh, the anarchist, anachronist, economist. So would you mind maybe going into some details of what that means? Sure. The anachronist is really irrelevant for your purposes. One of my hobbies is historical recreation mm. in an organization called the Society for Creative Anachronism. And I've been involved with that to varying degrees for about 50 years now. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I and my wife and daughter cook from very old cookbooks back to about the 10th century. Uh, I build furniture and make jewelry and tell stories and write poems. It's a lot of fun, but it really has not much to do with my political interests. They only very occasionally overlap. Uh, Economist, because economics to me is a way of making sense of the world. It's not the study of money or prices or whatever. It's really understanding behavior on the assumption that individuals are rational. What we mean by rational is not how they think, but that they tend to get the right answer. That they, on the whole, if you want to go somewhere, you're likely to start in that in the right direction. And if you've been there a few times, you're likely to take the shortest route. And much more generally, that you can make a good deal of sense, not perfect sense, but a good deal of sense out of the behavior of people on that simple assumption. And that's what economics is really built on. And it then becomes a way of making sense of not only what we usually think of as economic behavior, but questions such as why are marriages less stable than they used to be, uh, what affects crime rates, a whole bunch of, of anything that really comes down to human behavior, you have at least a possibility of understanding with economics. And that's sort of what I've done professionally for a very long time, but it's also a way of thinking that I find not the only way of making sense of the world, but a very attractive and interesting one. An anarchist, what I mean by that is that I think the ideal society would not have a government. Uh, I don't think that a society without a government is stable under all possible circumstances. So in that sense, I'm pessimistic. But I think there are a fairly wide range of circumstances in which such a society could work. My first book, uh, among other things, sketched a 
imaginary, a hypothetical picture of what a society with private property and trade and without government might look like, where you had what we think of as the fundamental government functions all being provided privately. And that was published. Uh, it's the early 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, about 40 years ago. And the third edition, with another 100 pages or so, came out, I think, maybe two years ago. Okay. Uh, and my most recent book on legal systems very different from ours, where I was looking at a whole lot of mostly historical legal systems, and I concluded that, in a sense, what I had been doing in my first book was reinventing the wheel, because there are historical societies, noticeable number, in which law enforcement was private and decentralized. And I've got the, I, I describe a number of such societies in the book on legal systems. One of my chapters is a discussion of how such societies work. And I think that what I sketched in my first book was a sort of fancy modern, modern society version of what those societies really were. That, hmm. You know, when you, when you teach an economics, when you write an economics textbook, or teach a course, you may start out with Robinson Crusoe and Friday and sort of a very simplified picture. And there's a sense in which I was doing the fancy version of what the, of what the simplified picture of which it actually existed. So that was sort of one of the interesting things. A lot of other things, it was a fun book to write because I ended up learning about uh, Amish and uh, Romani and uh, Imperial Chinese. That was a legal system that lasted about 2,000 years. It's sort of one of the world record holders for longevity. Uh, Pericle in Athens, which I like to describe as the legal system of a mad economist, <laughs> because they've got all sorts of clever ideas which might or might not work. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. But anyway, so so those are the things that, uh, that, that I do. Yeah. So look, at it, it, it's interesting. I'm going to skip ahead to a couple of quest questions that I had for you. With you know, with your with your specific book coming out as as long ago as it as it did, a lot of things have transpired since then. So, with the ver the updated the updates you've made to to the book, and you said most recently just two two years ago, like what what's what's changed, or or maybe how have you experienced you know our I would say rise in maybe a, a stronger centrally planned uh, government than may have existed in the in the seventies, early seventies. Like, what has I'm been your experience sure and looking at that and analyzing it? I'm not. I'm not sure that's true. That, as far as I can tell, things are usually changing in both directions at once. That, on the one hand, a lot of the bad ideas of the early seventies are much less fashionable now. Uh, everybody takes floating exchange rates for granted, for example. Uh, and in general, deregulation to some significant degree happened. The trucking industry got deregulated. The airlines got deregulated. At the same time, environmentalism has, in an odd sense, substituted for socialism. That is, back when I was writing, I think a lot of reasonable people actually thought that something like the Soviet model worked that I think a fairly popular view was it's not a very attractive society, it's not a very free society, maybe we won't want to do that, but economically it works. They're developing, they're going to catch up with us and so forth. We now know that wasn't true, that it was, it, as it were, by its own standards, it was a flop. Uh, and I think there are people nowadays who call themselves socialists, but most of them, they don't mean we think we should have the government running the steel industry and the auto industry and everything else, which was the Soviet model. They mean a number of different things. That socialism, even back when I wrote Machinery, I pointed out that socialism had become a sort of a term with no content and, and positive sort of feel-good value, because it, it can mean a lot of different things for different people. But the most common usage nowadays is to refer to a welfare state like the Scandinavian countries, which are basically market societies. In some ways, they're more free market than the US, hmm. but have quite a lot of redistribution. Uh, so, but uh, socialism in the old sense, I think, is largely dead. And environmentalism has replaced it in that environmentalism provides a new set of arguments for why the government should interfere with the free market. In one sense, that's progress because they're better, they're, better they're better arguments. Socialist was just wrong. Environmentalist argument is not inherently wrong. On the other hand, in practice, you end up with governments doing undesirable things with environmental excuses. 
So I guess maybe the clearest example of that would be biofuels. The U.S. is the world's largest produ producer of corn, maize. And the U.S., I think, is currently turning something like a quarter of its corn crop into alcohol. And the excuse for doing this was the claim that that would reduce CO2 output. Uh, apparently, it isn't true. That is, as far as I can tell, the people who were sort of serious about environmentalism eventually came to the conclusion that you were producing at least as much CO2 in the process of growing your, your crops. I mean, the theory of it is that the crops absorb CO2 when they're growing to produce your maize and then just put it back, so that's nothing. But of course, you also have tractors and trucks moving the corn around and so forth. And I, I gather at least the conclusion <laughs> is that it doesn't impact. But, there's a net impact. Yeah, there's a net associated with it, yeah. But having biofuels does push up the price of corn, and that's something that farmers like. So we are putting a good deal of effort into making poor people in the world hungry by making one of the major food crops more expensive in the world on the excuse of environmentalism. And I think that's true of quite a lot, if you look at it, uh, of what's going on so that environmentalism has substituted for socialism in the sense of a different set of arguments, but again, for the government interfering. However, it's again the case that we have no good way of getting governments to do the right thing. That the, the way I like to put it is there's a term market failure, which describes most generally ways in which individually rational behavior doesn't combine for group rational behavior. That sort of the, for people who are familiar with the prisoner's dilemma, that's the two-person version of market failure. Market failure is not about markets. Market failure is a pattern in human behavior which occurs in a whole lot of different contexts. So when I give a talk about it, that includes things like uh, the failure of the market to produce a public good, a good where you can't control who gets it. But it also includes rational ignorance in voting because when you figure out who's the best person to vote for, you're producing a public good, you're producing a benefit which almost all of which goes to other people. You have very little incentive to do that. And the result is that most Americans don't in fact know most of the things they would need to know to have a respectable opinion on who to vote for. And that they're rational in, in that. So my view at least is that it's not that the market is perfect. It's only that the same things that cause the market to sometimes fail cause the political alternative to usually fail. Hmm. That, that, that market failure ultimately comes because I am taking an action where you are bearing the cost or where you are getting the benefit either way. And if I'm taking an action where other people bear the costs, it pays me to take it even if the total costs are larger than its whole get benefits, as long as I get a benefit. If I'm taking an action where other people get the benefit, it doesn't pay me to take it, even if total benefits are larger than total costs. On a market, that's a fairly unusual situation. It sort of takes a semester or so of price theory, but roughly to sort of a first approximation, when you buy something, you're paying all of the costs associated with producing something. When you produce something, you're receiving all the benefits as a result of producing it. So roughly speaking, you have the ideal situation where each individual actor gets the benefits and pays the cost of his action, and then he takes the right action. There are exceptions, but those are exceptions on the market, and those are the normal situation on the political system. In a political system, almost never does someone making a decision bear the costs or receive the benefits of it. So the result then is that with environmentalism, You've got a legitimate argument for why, if the government did the right things, it could improve things, but the government mostly doesn't do the right things, and therefore it becomes an argument that has bad effects rather than. Rather than and you're saying that they're not—they don't do the right things because you know there's benefits when they make decisions, but the consequences don't necessarily exist. Be, be, because the, to begin with, if you really took global warming arguments seriously, no country would do anything at all about it unless they had an agreement with all the other countries to do it. I'm in California. California does various expensive things to reduce CO2 output. California's CO2 output, I'm guessing, is less than 1% of the world's CO2 output. Hence, anything it reduces means that temperatures 100 years from now will be perhaps a hundredth of a degree centigrade less than they would be if they didn't do those things. So it's absolutely crazy to do them if you're thinking of people in California benefiting California by controlling global warming. 
On the other hand, there may be other reasons to do them, as in my biofuels case, which isn't California, but the US federal government, you can get the votes of farmers. And Al Gore, to his credit, admitted at one point that he was pushing biofuels because he was running for president, and Iowa was an early primary. Uh, and that was a point after he decided it was a mistake. Because uh, it would help farmers. What? Because it would help farmers. Yeah. It would, it would increase the income of farmers by bidding up the price of one of their main crops. Well, let's, um, let's, take, a, let's take a couple of steps back. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a couple of steps back because I, I think that the, your view of the world is, you know, is significant and your explanations have been, have been incredible. Uh, you, you've been influenced to, you know, be aware of economics, be aware of society in a different way uh, from your family history, which is you know, your fa father, uh, Milton Friedman, being, you know, one of the, I think, er early parts of the you know, Chicago School of, of Economics. Mm -hmm. And so maybe talk just a, a little bit about some of the things that he did that influenced you the, the most and, and why. Yeah. You know, and, and why. I guess one thing was uh, lessons in child rearing. Uh, in my view, there are two theories of children. One is that they are pets who can talk, and one is that they are small people who don't know very much yet. And I believe in the second theory. Yeah. And as far as I can remember, I, have ne I never had an argument with my father where he said, well, I'm the grown-up, so I'm right. It was always, here are the reasons. You know, if I have better reasons, fine. If he has better reasons, fine. And I think that was a very important lesson about interacting with people in general, even at the level of an adult interacting with a child. Uh, so that would certainly be one important lesson. Uh, I think my general approach to economics has been very much influenced by, by his. Uh, the way I think of the Chicago School approach, and I consider myself a Chicago School economist, is that economic theory gives you plausible guesses but not certain conclusions that if you, it is very hard to think of any real world conclusion which couldn't be true consistent with economics if you make sufficiently extreme assumptions about things like what people value or how you produce things, which economics doesn't tell you. That is, economics takes utility functions, which is what people value, and production functions, which is how you make stuff, as an, something you get from the outside. And uh, my, Example of that used to be the minimum wage law, that Jim Buchanan, who was a colleague of mine early on, used to say that all economists agree that minimum wage laws call, cause unemployment. And that's not an empirical statement, that's a definition of economist. And he's wrong. Uh, he's wrong because although you would certainly expect it to happen, you can imagine some circumstances in which it wouldn't. And my old example was to imagine there are a lot of consumers who really hate the thought that they're buying something produced by very low wage labor. And therefore, they'll buy more of the stuff that the unskilled laborers produced if it's paid more. Uh, and that used to be my example. But in fact, there was an article that got quite a long time, a lot of attention, and is unfortunately has bad effects, but it was a good article in which somebody actually had a economic theory, which well, didn't require as wild an assumption as that, in which putting increasing the minimum wage under some circumstances would increase the employment of low-skilled workers. And it was a very clever idea, uh, had to do with assuming that the employers were monopsonies, were monopoly employers, and were therefore holding wages, hiring fewer people in order to hold wage levels down, and now if you push the wage level up, they can't do it anymore, then they hire more people. That's too short. As, but it was a clever argument. Unfortunately, it's then gotten used by people who want to push high minimum wages, which I think are a mistake. Uh, but nonetheless, it demonstrated that not only could you make a wildly unlikely argument for, for this, I would say, wrong conclusion, you could make a not absurd argument for, for this wrong conclusion. So the Chicago method, as I understand it, is you form your conjectures from the theory and you then find ways of testing them against real world facts. That my first journal article, a very long time ago, was an economic theory of the size and shape of nations, in which I claimed to explain features of the map of Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire to the present. And I submitted it to the Journal of Political Economy, and George Stigler, who was the editor, rejected it. And he rejected it on the grounds that I had no empirical tests of my theory. Hmm. And well, how do you? 
test a theory about the size of nations. And I thought up some ways, some predictions the theory made about certain patterns of the shapes of countries at various times. And I revised the article uh, and George accepted it. Uh, and one result of that was that I have a little more evidence that my theory is true. But the other result, it turned out, was that I had to think much more carefully about what my theory actually was saying in order to figure out how to test it. That if you're trying to link your sort of mathematical model to the real world, you have to be a little more careful about what each, each term actually means. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think a good methodological approach for economics is to use the theory to figure out what you think is true. And then say, well, if I'm right, what implications will it have? What facts of reality that I don't already know could I observe to, to test the theory? So that was certainly, I suppose, the largest intellectual influence. Now, my father was a classical liberal. I'm a more extreme classical liberal, uh, namely an anarcho-capitalist. So he was certainly an influence on me in, in that way as, as well. Uh, I'm not, I think in terms of formal economics, I may well have learned more from other things, but but in terms of sort of as a habit of thinking. Uh, so one of my, one of the questions I wanted to ask really relates to this uh, point, I believe, which is, you know, how, how have you, you know, come to understand freedom uh, and the different theories of, of economics that are, are out there and how has it changed uh, over, over time? But you went back to a really, you know, a, a, to the past and started to, I, I would assume, understand patterns and, and identify patterns. And today it seems like, you know, a lot of the cause of, you know, the, the lack of progress or the cause of, of uh, cycles, mm -hmm. right, is, is in part by, you know, the same force, which I would assume is, a, from what you're saying, is a central, kind of a, a central drive from a government power as opposed to it being done by the people. Yeah, there are a bunch of reasons why things aren't as good as they should be. Certainly one of them is that governments have the wrong incentives. Uh, Another one, going back to my rational ignorance point, is that voters in a democracy have the wrong incentive. That it really makes very little sense, unless you're an extraordinarily benevolent person, to actually spend effort figuring out what policies are best for your country. <laughs> that the sensible thing to do if you're going to be involved in politics is to figure out what political position will make you most popular with the people who matter to you who might be your family, or might be your neighbors, they might be your co-workers, and persuade yourself of that policy. Uh, there's some very interesting work by Dan, Daniel uh, Kahan, I think his, his name is, at Yale, law professor, who has looked at uh, issues, at, at issues where positions have become markers of group identity. So if you think about evolution, for example, that saying you're against evolution puts you in a particular group, as it were, or views on, on, on global warming or, or gun control, those would all do that. And his claim is that if you measure how intellectually able people are, the more intellectually able someone is, the more likely he is to agree with the position that, his, that the group he's a part of holds, whether that means believing in evolution or not believing in evolution. And he has an explanation of this. He says, this is rational behavior. Because whether I believe in evolution has essentially no effect on the world. It's going to happen with or without me. But it has a large effect on my relation to people around me. If I'm a professor at an <laughs> elite American university and I say that I don't believe in evolution, my, all of my colleagues are going to say, look at that stupid, uneducated fellow. If I'm somebody living in a small town where everybody is the member of the same fundamentalist church, and I say I believe in evolution, you know, nobody's going to want to marry my daughter uh, or me. I mean, so in that sense, I think he's right that it makes sense that it's in your interest not to believe what's true in those contexts. It, you want to believe what's true in things where your decisions affect you. You want to believe what's true about what cars will or won't run but about whether there's really global warming doesn't much matter from that standpoint, but it matters for how you get along with people around you. Uh, so in that sense, we, don't, we, we do not have a good mechanism for making those decisions. Uh, there isn't one. And I've argued in the past that shifting more and more things to the market at least gets you closer. There's this famous quote from, uh, from Winston Churchill 
that democracy is the worst form of government ever invented by the mind of man, except for all of the others that have been tried. <laughs> and people usually take that as a defense of democracy, but it isn't. It's a critique of government. What it's saying is the best form of government we have works terribly. And so I take that as an argument for saying wherever possible, shift things away from the government model to the market exchange model. I like to say that the very best form of government is competitive dictatorship. That's how we run restaurants. That's how we run hotels. I get no vote on what's on the menu, but an absolute vote on whether I go to that restaurant. And then the person running the restaurant has an incentive to put the things on the menu that his customers want. Right? Uh, so I'd like to push, shift as much in that direction as possible. Hmm. And what I've argued is that you may be able to move everything in that direction. Uh, and there will still be problems because as I say, the market doesn't always get the right result. It's just got a better, better odds than the alternative. Uh, and if you can't move everything, you can at least move a lot of things in that direction. But that's really been my view. I mean, I've thought it through a little bit more over the years, but that's been my basic view for, for a long time. So, so my view is changed, the only view I can think of has changed is that I think I am less optimistic about using the tort system as a substitute for regulation. If you think about, what seemed like a good argument, which is to say, you don't need to make, to have regulatory rules against people doing bad things because you can just have them sued instead. And that only works if you believe the legal system does a good job of figuring out who is damaged whom. And we've just had a case, which hopefully is not finished, but where somebody was awarded a multi-billion dollar judgment against Monsanto for a product which essentially everybody who is seriously expert in it believes is harmless. But they claim they got cancer due to it. Some people get cancer. If you got cancer and you handled, I think it was Roundup. Uh, yeah, Roundup. Uh, glyph glyphosate or glyphosate, or the exact name. You can claim, you can even believe it's because of that. If you can persuade a jury, that first they figure out the cost of cancer, then they say, but wait a minute, we really want to punish them because of all these other people. So you can get very bad results. So uh, at this point, uh, I'm, I'm less optimistic about that as an alternative. But of course, the system I want is one in which the laws themselves are generated on the market. That's what I sketch in Machinery hmm. of Freedom. Hmm. That would do better. It still has, I have one chapter in, in the new edition on market failure on the market for law in which I'm discussing where will my best system still give the wrong answer. And then there are places where, where it predictably will, I think. It's just that I don't know of anything better. We are definitely complex creatures, aren't we? And we have, and there are a lot of us, and yeah. we're interacting in complicated ways. Yeah. So how, maybe going a different angle, this, this season, you know, I've tried to focus on the, the entrepreneur and the value that they have uh, in, uh, in, in the world. How, as you've understood economics, have you, as you understood uh, markets, what, how, how do you describe the, uh, the role of the entrepreneur? It's not something I've thought about very much, that the kind of economics we understand best is price theory. And price theory usually starts out by assuming that everybody makes the right decisions. So it's therefore missing the whole issue, missing a lot of issues necessarily. Uh, so it's missing the issue of the person who figures out uh, that everybody else is doing it wrong and then does it right. Now, individually, uh, I sort of believe in that, that I, at various points I've made investments where I was basically betting my prediction of the future against the market prediction. The, the first, well, probably the first one was when I bought Apple stock. And that was when the Macintosh first came out, the original Mac. And I was a professor at Tulane Business School at the time. And I told one of my colleagues that I was uh, planning to buy a Mac. And he said, well, why don't you get a PC Junior instead? And it occurred to me that that was a natural question for him to ask, because they're about the same physical size. But it was an absurd question to anybody who really was familiar with the technology, because the Mac was one of the very first machines to use a graphic interface, which is what we all take for granted now. I knew about graphic interfaces because I had seen a movie about the Xerox Park work with the original graphic interface. Mm -hmm. uh, I also knew that the processor the Mac used was a Motorola 68000, 
which was a much more powerful processor than the probably 8086 or 8088 that the PC Junior used. It was one that before that was normally used for multi-user machines. And why was that? Because running, a gra running the graphic interface takes a lot of horsepower. Basically, there's a lot of processing invisible to you as the user that goes on to doing it in the way we now do it rather than doing it in the way we had done it. I had a computer before that, a, neither of those before the Mac existed. And so I knew about the normal way of doing what's called a command line interface, which is much clumsier, uh, but much easier for the computer. So I said, wait a minute. I know that his question is silly. His question is the question that almost everybody investing on the market is going to be, would, would ask. A very small fraction of the people in the market back in whatever that was, God, I, I have to wear out when it was, but it was a long time ago, uh, were sufficiently into computer technology to know about Xerox Park, to know about graphic interfaces, to know about different processors. Therefore, I said, everything the market is probably pricing Apple correctly in every other respect. They're missing a very large positive. Therefore, the stock is underpriced. Hmm. So in that sense, I wasn't an entrepreneur in the sense of starting a company, but I was in the sense of saying I'm willing to bet against the world. Uh, and I've made a number of other such bets, which, some of which have done very well. Uh, well, that's where you look at, again, going to that example, you know, you, you identified something, but then also, you know, the just... The, the nature of the Mac coming into the marketplace, which was they understood that there would be a competitive advantage, possibly. I mean, it was a bet that they made, but there would be a competitive advantage having a more graphic interface because of how people respond, right, to colors and to graphics uh, as opposed to it's responding. It's not responding to colors and to graphics. It's, it's the difference between uh, saving something, between doing something by moving stuff around on the screen and doing something by typing in words. Yeah. yeah. Try to imagine Total experience of it. Yeah. You try, yeah. You try to imagine, you know, eating dinner using a text-based interface. <laughs> what do you do? You say, uh, take fork, stick fork and spaghetti, twirl stork around, move fork as opposed to <laughs> fork. So it, w it was a much easier and more intuitive way of interacting. And I should say Bill Gates knew it too. Uh, my, I think my second successful investment was in Microsoft. And the reason there was that I observed, this was later, that the dominant word processor and spreadsheet on the Mac were both made by Microsoft. And I said, why in the world is Microsoft investing its resources in a platform where they have no advantage? That Microsoft was running the operating system for MS-DOS at the time, I think this was pre-Windows. Uh, and yet they are willing to go to a considerable effort to have a word processor and a spreadsheet on the Mac OS where they've got no advantage over anybody else. Aha, I said, Bill Gates, I know that graphic interfaces are, are the path to the future. I bet Bill Gates knows that too. I know that you can't run a graphics interface successfully on the current PCs because they don't have enough horsepower to do it. But that's going to change. Processes are getting faster. Uh, the people building those computers are going to build fa faster computers. I bet what Bill Gates is doing is using the Mac, which is a tiny market compared to the PC market, as the test bed to develop a word processor and a spreadsheet that work really well in a graphic interface. And then in another few years, when his world moves to graphic interfaces, which was Windows, uh, he's going to walk into the market already having his tested programs. And that's, in my view, why Word and Excel are the dominant word processor and spreadsheet today. Uh, so I said, well, if, 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 if Gates is clever enough to do that, I ought to buy stock in this company. Uh, so how do you, because it's interesting. So is, do, do, you, do you define whether it's Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, their drive to come up with these, you know, these, uh, uh, products, right, that don't necessarily exist or to make these uh, company decisions yeah. to test and yeah. eventually get on the marketplace. Do you describe that as like an entrepreneurial drive or do you? That's entrepreneurial behavior, but it's not yeah. something that I can fit into economics beyond observing that exists. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's really there, are, there are other things like that. There are technologies that are very important in economics that we don't understand. Uh -huh. you Is it natural for that to behavior to occur if you have a specific type of framework? 
Yeah, it probably occurs in, in most frameworks, though. I, I, I bet there were entrepreneurs in the Soviet Union. They were just being entrepreneurial about different things. They were huh. being entrepreneurial okay. about how do I get my kid into a good school? Who do I have to do favors for? Uh, yeah, this is really interesting. Other ways and so forth. It was a perverse system, so they weren't, in fact, doing useful things mostly. Very interesting. And there are certainly social entrepreneurs, people who are you know good at uh, making other people like them, good at creating you know friendship groups and, and mm, things like it. that so so i think entrepreneurial behavior is is broader than the market but it certainly plays an important role in the market and that really involves people figuring out see let me give you a different example of a technology i don't understand though i appreciate it and that's why are some companies happy all right that there was a lumber yard uh, near here which unfortunately no longer exists and my general feeling buying lumber there for projects I was doing was that the people there liked each other and liked their customers and sort of felt like that kind of place. And on the whole, I get that feeling about Southwest Airlines today. I, I like riding them. And everybody tries to give that impression. And I'm sure to some extent it's true of, of some of the competitors. How do you do it? If you are the president of a company, how, what are the decisions that result and you can see it's not a trivial problem because on the one hand, you want to punish employees who do a bad job. On the other hand, punishing people is likely to make you unpopular with them and their friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so forth. So, so there's clearly a sort of a highly developed technology to running companies. And all I can say is for me, that's a black box. That is for me as an economist, that's a black box. That, that we describe it as a production function. You put some inputs in and you get some outputs out. And... You might be able to observe the production function, but I don't really understand it. Just as I don't understand the details of how they make cars, right? I mean, that's got to be a very, very complicated. I was just reading a review of a book, which was discussing the difficulty of primitive technology. It was somebody who was, uh, interesting story, I don't know if he's right, but his account is that there are a number of cases, I guess, in the 19th century, where you've got European explorers uh, who end up somehow stranded in an environment where the local primitives are doing just fine and starve to death. And his point is that actually surviving as an Eskimo or surviving as a hunter-gatherer in the Amazon requires a lot of very sophisticated skills. Then he goes through a, details of this long sequence of things you have to do to hunt seals, hmm. uh, most of which would never occur to you. And one of the main food foodstuffs in South America is manioc, which is poisonous. And therefore, there are elaborate procedures for purifying it. And so, so and there are lots of technologies. We just we tend to think more about modern technologies, but the human beings have been doing complicated things for a very long time. Well, have you look, have you studied behavioral economics or looked into you know essentially I, their I, I read, behind why what drives people you know why do they behave and do certain things based on certain circumstances? I've read Kahneman's book uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. I thought it's a very good book. There was one year that was our Christmas book, meaning it was the book we gave as a present to anybody we didn't have another present for. Cool. Uh, and but what he's really doing is explaining why people make mistakes. Okay. But the, the, the basic logic of that book is that we have two different mach metal machines for doing things, what he calls the fast mind and the slow mind. And the slow mind is what we normally think of as thinking, rational thought. When I look at this screen, what I am seeing is not some uh, gray here and some pink here and uh, some little round brown circles with black dots in the middle there. I'm seeing a human face and a wall of an office and eyes and pupils and so forth. I'm not doing any explicit analysis to do that. All right, I've got incoming, just a pattern of colors. Mm -hmm. And yet in the ba very fast background processing, it resolves that into a picture of what I'm actually seeing. All right. And Kahneman's argument is that the slow mind is a very scarce resource, that consequently we can't afford to think everything through. And we have a whole bunch of rules of thumb, which work pretty well, but not perfectly, for the 99% of our thinking that's done in the background. And if you analyze what those rules of thumb are, you can sometimes figure out what mistakes we'll make. That, and that's sort of a neat idea. Uh, I don't think I've seen any interesting economics using that. It's 
Uh, certainly people are trying to use, use that in, in economics, but that's because in order to be a successful academic, you've got to do something that looks new. And <laughs> when you've got a question, if you have an issue that smart people have been thinking about for a hundred years, saying something new about it is hard. And one way to say, oh, we've got a new approach. We've got this thing called behavioral economics. Let's do the behavioral economics of X, Y, and Z. Uh, and maybe there's something good being done there, but I haven't actually seen anything that struck me as my knowing anymore as a result. What I want people to do behavioral economics with is not my field. It's macroeconomics. If you think about why there are recessions and depressions and involuntary unemployment and stuff like that, in the part of economics that I understand, none of that happens. That in ordinary price theory, prices always move quantity supply to quantity demanded for labor like everything else. Right? It's a nice model. It's, it, it's something we actually understand and it describes quite a large part of reality, but it clearly doesn't describe all of it because you do have these, these episodes. As far, I don't do macro, but as far as I can tell of the people who do ma do macro, is the, is the background noise too high at this point? Or is it hard? But the people who do do macro, almost all of them involve a theory in which lots of people are making the same mistake over and over. And what the mistake is varies with the different versions of macro. So that if, as best I understand Austrian business school, business cycle theory, which I don't understand very well, it involves the idea that the government produces money, drives down the interest rate, and business people then assume the interest rate will be low forever, make investments on that basis, and then discover, lo and behold, the government stops producing money, interest rates go back up, we've got to liquidate a bunch of stuff. But that's stupid because, at least it'd be stupid the sixth time it happened. You would say after a while, they say, wait a minute, we know why the interest rates are low, it's only going to apply for the next year, so very short-term investments you can do even if they pay with a low interest rate, but long-term. Similarly, the sort of simple versions of monetarist business cycle theory is, as I understand it, are that you've got some level of rate of increase in the money supply, it results in a certain level of inflation. Everyone takes that for granted. Then the government stops increasing the money supply. People, workers still expect the annual wage rise implied by that inflation. Uh, but at that wage, employers don't want to hire as many workers as want to work, so you get unemployment. But again, you would think that after a few times, people would start saying, well, let's watch the money supply figures, let's watch this. And what's... So one of the things that behavioral economics does is explain why people make mistakes and why lots of people make the same mistakes. So I want somebody who's interested in macro to see if he can use behavioral economics in order to explain why people don't solve the, these things in the way I'm describing. But that's not my project. That's just a project no, I'm trying else. to sell to someone else who does stuff I don't do. I, I have a variety of such projects that I try to get other people interested in. Well, let's maybe end, end, with, end with this. What, what are ways in which listeners can, fo can follow you, learn more about you, uh, you know, follow what you're up to, some of the projects you're working on and so forth? Yeah. Well, to start with, I've got a web page, which is daviddfriedman.com. So that's easy to remember. You do need the middle initial D because somebody beat me to davidfriedman.com by a few months. Uh, and on that web page, there are links to most of my published articles and the full text of several of my books. So that's probably the easiest way. There's also a link to my blog and my blog has interesting stuff on it, but I post very rarely to it now, mostly because I got interested in somebody else's blog, which has a lot more activity and lots of interesting conversations. So mostly I'm doing things on Slate Star Codex, which is the name of a blog that I don't run, but where I participate. Uh, in terms of my writing, the most recent book is Legal Systems Very Different from Ours. And that is all you can get on Amazon, and it's a very inexpensive Kindle. I don't remember whether I made it $5 or $3, but something like that. Okay. Uh, Machinery of Freedom, which is my first book in the third edition, is also an inexpensive Kindle as well as a print version. Uh, not, not, I, not in audio format? Uh, actually, Machinery is also in audio format. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I haven't checked on whether anybody's actually buying it, but, but basically part of the reason it's in audio format 
is that when I needed a cover, for, I self-published legal systems. Okay. So I needed somebody to do a cover for me. And a nice lady on Facebook, who obviously was familiar with my work, designed a very nice cover for it, which I used. And she also said that I really ought to have machinery as an audio book. And so I figured she'd done a favor for me. I would do one for her, and it might, she might be right. It might, in fact, be useful to people. So Machinery 3rd Edition, you can get as an audio book. My only other audio book is my first novel, which is called Harold. And that one I had recorded a long time ago for other reasons. And then once audio books became important, I figured I might as well turn it into an audio book. And I'd like to do an audio book of Hidden Order, but that depends on whether or not we get the rights back from the publisher. I think that's Hidden Order. I wrote a price theory textbook a long time ago, and I'm just in the final stages of turning, of creating a third edition of that as a Kindle, which I'm going to self-publish because it went out of print. And when it goes out of print, the rights revert to me. Uh, Hidden Order was basically the price theory textbook rewritten into a book for the interested layman. So it's not intended as a textbook, as a book for somebody who wants to teach himself economics. Hmm. And I'm sure you can still buy copies, but I don't think they're actually printing it anymore. Okay. And I'm hoping I, that it's sufficiently out of print that I can get the rights back. And then I'll make that into a Kindle and maybe also into an audio book. I'm less certain of that. Uh, but I've got a variety of other books people might find interesting. Uh, my second novel, Salamander, which I like, and I'm going to have a third novel fairly shortly, I think. Uh, those were all for fun. None of them were very successful, but some people like them and I like them. Uh, and uh, my book, uh, Law's Order, which is a explanation of the economic analysis of law, which was what I've been doing professionally for a good deal over the last 30 years or so. Uh, and I hope people would find that interesting. And I have a book, Future Imperfect, which is looking at ways in which technological change may radically change the world over the next 30 years or so. So, And that's in the works or that's- No, that's, that was pretty decent. some years ago. That's, that's available. Okay. I don't even know if it's a Kindle because it was commercially published, so I wasn't doing it, but it probably is. But it certainly is a print version. It's okay. not an audio book. Uh, and I guess well, I could make an audio book, but I need permission from the publisher. Uh, and that one, basically, my view is that the future is very uncertain. I think when people talk seriously about what we have to do to solve problems 100 years from now, they're making a mistake. That we don't know enough about what the world is going to be like 100 years from now to do those calculations. So what I'm doing there is looking at a bunch of different technological revolutions that might happen. If it happens, what are the implications? What are the problems? How might you deal with them? And I, after I wrote that book, after I published the book, I gave a talk at Google on the book. Hmm. And I started out by saying that I thought global warming was a pretty wimpy catastrophe. So temperatures go up by a few degrees centigrade. Sea level goes up by a meter or so in 100 years. I've got three different ways of wiping out the human race faster than that. <laughs> and I do. That is, you can, In fact, you can see, I also have on my web page, I have a link to a whole lot of videos of talks I gave, including Does that. it include that Google, the one you did that, with Google? Yes, that, that is in fact there, but lots of talks on different things. Some of them are audios, some of them like that one are videos. Okay. So if you just go to my web page, it's not a very fancy web page, but if you look down it, you can find the link to my recorded, my web uh, talks and interviews, and that will give you lots more of those. Well, David, this has been fascinating. Thank you again for taking some time to share your, uh, share your expertise. This went, pr this went pretty deep, but I, I, I think this has been a, a great addition to this, uh, this season. And I think that, great. you know, people got a lot out of it. So thank you. Thank you so much.